Welcome to episode five of the Drew Keynes podcast. Super excited for my guest today. This is Matt Gabriel. And Matt Gabriel is a survivalist as well as an animal expert and a businessman within the animal industry. We'll get talking about that soon. Super excited to have him on. Thanks for being thanks, on, man. Thanks for having me here, man. I'm excited to do it. So first of all, uh, can I tell people uh, what you do as far as your business goes with Animal World Experience? Yeah, so that's the business I started first. Um, I opened that officially in 2006. But before that, you know, I have a background doing all kinds of um, work with animals. I was, I was a groomer. I worked at a pet store. I used to design and maintain aquariums. Um, I worked as a vet tech. Um, I worked for private zoos, all kinds of things. And I knew, you know, I was going to college for art, which I love too. But I knew that I wanted to work with animals. So I stopped going to college and I began working for several different private zoos doing traveling educational programs. And I just loved it. And I didn't even know that job existed until uh, a local pet shop hired me. I thought he wanted me to work in the shop. And what he really wanted was for me to do the traveling educational programs. And I didn't know that that was a thing, but I loved it. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. So opened up for myself 2006. And um, I go to all different kinds of places. You know, sometimes it's birthday parties. I go to schools, libraries, kids' museums. I do a lot with nursing homes and also children with disabilities. Um, all different places. So it's, it's fun. It's, it's a fun job. I'm in different places, different people all the time. And I get to play with animals. So, so that's, so that's cool. right there. Yeah. Yeah. So a little background on how I met Matt. Um, it was indirectly through your business. Um, I was actually looking into rattlesnakes, the timber rattlesnake, which for those of you in or outside of Massachusetts who don't know, we actually do have rattlesnakes in the state in some sparse locations. Um, but I happened to be researching them, looking into them. And I came across across one of your YouTube channels, Animal World Experience. And you had a couple of videos talking about rattlesnakes. And I was like, this is really cool. Um, I thought something important with these rattlesnakes was mentorship, because I know they're very hard to find. Yeah. So I hit you up on Instagram on, it's, what's it, at Animal World Experience, I believe? On Instagram, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I found your Instagram, hit you up, and we got talking, and we got looking out for snakes a week or two later. Super yeah. awesome. Yeah, that was a fun time, even though we got skunked, but the time of the yeah. year that it was, was yeah. not a good Mid-July, time. Mid-July, I believe. Yeah, and I have found them over the summer, but it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult um, because you don't have an actual specified location like a den site mm-hmm. to look for, and they're, they're all spread out, you know, so I didn't expect we'd see anything, you know, but it was a good time anyway. I had fun. Yeah, I've been, um, I remember you recommended a book to me, Landscape with a Reptile. Yes. Actually, I bought it and I started reading it. Here it is right hey. here. Hey! That is there one of is. my top two favorite books ever. Awesome. And I actually, book. I actually met the author and I went rattlesnaking with him, which was awesome. Oh, Tom Tomer? Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Did you find any? Um, yeah, that day I went out with him. It's, it's kind of funny. Like, what got me into rattlesnakes, I moved to Mass when I was 20. And I've always had really bad allergies and asthma. And I began going to an allergy doctor in Quincy. And I remember the first time going in his waiting room. He, he's also like on the side, he takes like professional quality photographs and he travels all over the world taking photographs. And he had photos wow. of monkeys and, and he had several photos of close-ups of rattlesnakes. And as soon as I got in, I'm like, where'd you take those? And he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> and this became a thing. Like every time I'd go in his office once a week, I'd badger him and badger him. And finally he began giving me little snippets and tidbits. And after about like two years, he was like, all right, I'll take you out. And, and he showed me where one of the dens was. And that was, you know, him showing me that kind of unlocked it for me. And I got it. I, I got, I understood the type of places where the dens would be at. And then I began just finding other dens on my own. And I remember like, I'd go up and sit on the rocks and um, whenever I'm at a den, I'm, I'm always, I always make sure that I don't um, leave a trail where I'm walking. I don't want to lead anybody to find it because people know that they're in there, you know, they just don't know yeah. exactly where. So I'm always very careful and very quiet. And when I'm at the dens, if I see or hear anybody, I kind of duck down and hide myself to make sure they don't see me because if they see a guy up on the rocks just sitting there, they might come back later and snoop around and try to figure out what I was doing. Absolutely. And I don't want them to find a snake and kill it or step on a snake and that end up in the news. And all they, all they need now is more bad press, you know. Mm-hmm. But I was sitting up there one time and I heard somebody coming. So I'm ducking down, hiding between the rocks and I poke my head up and I can see like between the rocks with one eyeball and it's my <laughs> allergy doctor. So I stood <laughs> up and I waved and he was like, what the heck? So, so we went rattlesnaking for the day together. And then I think about a month later, um, he called me and he was like, yeah, um, my friend, my friend Tom 
is my good buddy Tom is going snaking with me. Do you want to meet us? And a biologist that worked for the state was going also. And, and I was like, yeah, man. And I didn't realize, I didn't put two and two together that it was Tom Palmer, but it was. That's so awesome. we went to several dens. We found a few snakes and, and that was really, really cool time. And I was like telling them like my favorite chapter of the book is this and blah, 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 blah. And it was just, a, it was, it was a good time. It was a cool experience. It's definitely among the people that I've kind of talked to or heard from about the subject, very sacred within that group, I would say. Yeah, there's um, very few people that know where they are and can find them on a regular basis. And it's crazy because in the book they talk about in I don't know, the 16 into the 1700s that rattlesnakes were everywhere. And then yeah. through development and really just persecution, people just destroyed these snakes in droves. And now yeah. it's turned that the people who know about them tend to love them like we do. But then most people back then wasn't the case. Yeah, a lot, a lot of it was really just reasons and superstitions and things like that. And because they just, people didn't know, they didn't understand what their place was and that they weren't going to go after people. And in order to get bit, you know, sometimes it could be an accident. You could step on one and not know what's there, but most of the time people got bit. It was because they're messing with them, trying to kill them or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely the way that the science has evolved over the years is important. Um, I I've just finished the chapter on the history and the evolution of kind of the remedies for snake bite. Mm -hmm. And I just thought some of these techniques they use are just absolutely crazy <laughs> back in like the 18th century, 19th century. Yeah. Yeah. Even up until recently, like, like, like putting ice on it. Yeah. Um, cryotherapy. Like, that. like, yeah. Like it seemed to work great at first. And then when you take the ice off, it's like worse. Yeah. That's kind of scary. Absolutely. But and me, even, like, sorry, go ahead. And even now the anti-venoms that we use, um, it's, they're up for debate. You know, it's, that's the modern medicine of snake bite. But since in the United States, they're so sparse, the science actually mm -hmm. is a lot less evolved than people may think. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like me, when I would go out there, I would go out there in like shorts and sneakers and just bring my camera bag and a bunch of bottles of water. And I was like, you know, if I ever got bit, I would just drink as much water as I possibly can to try to hydrate myself and hopefully dilute it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's an important thing that people overlook. I def I've never thought of that. Yeah. That's, I could definitely see how that would be a really good idea. Yeah. I don't touch them though. Um, I just get up real close and I've been rattled at twice just because of, you know, moving a stick out of the way that was in the way of my camera shot yeah. and it brushed against the snake and it ticked it off and it rattles at me. But they're com uh, compared to like black racers, which are up, you know, in, in rattlesnake areas and copperheads, which then with them also, the rattlesnakes are the most placid of the ones, you know, a lot of these snakes I've gotten to know the individual snakes over the years from going every spring and every fall. And I recognize them by their markings and some of them have like two different color eyes on the same snake and things like that. And um, they're, they're just placid. They just sit there. Some of them gradually go back in the den if, after I've been there for a few minutes and they get sick of me, but most of them just sit there and um, they're, they, they seem very gentle. They just, they're not going to bother you. They don't want to be bothered. Um, and what I noticed, which is really cool too, is they began to pattern me. And what I mean is my favorite den to go to um, which is the one that my allergy doctor showed me, the first den that I actually went to, um, I would always approach that from below and I'd come up the rocks. It's kind of a talus slope. And mm -hmm. there would be this one little landing where there was a large entrance hole and the snakes would always be lying right outside that hole in that one spot there. Yeah. And yeah. I would always come up from the, from the bottom up to the top. And one time I decided to do the opposite and I came down from above it and I kind of belly crawled and I peeked over and they were sitting there and the snakes could smell me and they were, their tongues were going and they were, their heads were kind of going back and forth down below on the rocks, the route that I usually came from. It's like, I, I, they're like, I smell him. <laughs> Where the heck is he? And I was like, mm -hmm. right, I was like three feet right above him. And they were wow. looking for me down the hill, which is kind of cool. I'm like, they know, they know where to look for me. How much of a period of time would you say that was that they kind of gained that behavior over? Uh, that one, that one spring where I was going there a lot, I really wanted to know the snakes very well and get to know them and, and the patterns and everything. I would go there probably twice a week, three times a week for the entire spring season that they're at the den. So like they come out of hibernation, they sit outside the den if it's a warm day and at night it gets too cold and they go back in and they yeah. do that for a few weeks until the weather's warm enough at night that they can disperse from the den to their summer feeding grounds. So you've got, you know, depending on the spring and the weather, you've got, 
anywhere from a week to three or four weeks where you can reliably find them there. But that spring, they were there for a while, and I I I kept on going. I will and definitely. Then, oh, go ahead. No, um, I was just gonna say, and then after I stopped seeing them there, I began traveling up the mountain further, and I had several spots where. I found rocks that had holes underneath them that they would kind of use as almost like, you know, if you're traveling on the highway, you know, you have like a rest stop that everyone stops at because Mm. there's food there and you can get gas and whatever. It's like snakes have the same kind of things. Like as they're traveling on their migrational seasonal migration route to their feeding grounds, I found that they have certain spots that they tend to hang out because there's shelter there. And I'd find these snakes in the same spots after the denning season every year. And I still find them in those spots. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, really interesting. And that's something that I know, unfortunately, contributes to kind of how difficult it is for these snakes to survive in a colder climate. Because uh, we've talked about how in, the, in like the southern regions for hibernation, a snake could just go into any rock or under any log, what have you, and begin to hibernate. But then when you go up to the north, they have to go to these den sites that are below the, is it the thermocline. Is that the word? I the call it the, fro- the frost line. Below yeah, the, the frost, frost line. line. Yeah. So yeah, they have to go to these den sites to get under the frost line or else they're going to freeze because, you know, none of these other spots are deep enough. And then yeah. uh, we're losing that territory. Yeah, and rattlesnakes are the largest, girthiest snake that we have here. So there's even less spots for them. They've got to find a spot where they can fit in between yeah. the rocks and get down below. Like garter snakes can, can hibernate kind of anywhere. That's why you see them around, around your house and everything. And, you know, in your yard, uh, the smaller snakes ha- have a much uh, larger um, area in which they can live and be able to hibernate. But the rattlesnakes, it's very, very particular. And one thing I found fascinating was that it's been observed that rattlesnakes born at a particular den sites will return there routinely. Yeah. Yep. I believe That's super it. That's cool. I believe it. And yeah, I, I've but... seen some babies there too. Yeah. So ones. I've read that. When those those babies usually hatch at the dens, and they'll spread out, go look for food, grow whatever, uh, and they'll be used, I assume, scent trails to routinely. My bad. Whoops. <laughs> they'll use scent trails to routinely return back to those same den sites in the fall, which I just think yeah. is absolutely crazy. Yeah, with the rattlesnakes, my understanding is I've never actually found a birthing area, but they have birthing areas which are kind of near the den where the females will always give birth in that same spot every time they're going to have a litter and they don't hatch from eggs rattlesnakes they give live birth um so i believe when the mother gives birth which will be like september ish she'll after she gives birth she'll stay there with the babies a few days to make sure they're good and then she will leave and go directly to the den and lay down a scent trail for the babies to follow to the den and she kind of in that way she shows them where they need to go for the den to survive the winter and that's kind of how it gets passed down interesting yeah. Have you noticed any common characteristics of these birth sites, really? Do you think there's anything special about them? I've, like I said, I've, I've never actually found a birth site. Um, oh, okay. what, I, what I know about them is from reading and talking to other uh, rattlesnakers, <laughs> rattlesnakers. <laughs> um, that, you know, like my allergy doctor and, and Tom Palmer, they found them. Um, and there's a few other guys that I talk to that, that go to den sites in other states. Like I've, I've gone rattlesnaking in Connecticut and in New York. And other guys go down south too. I mean, one of the guys I talked to goes in Pennsylvania a lot. That's a really good spot for rattlesnakes. Right. Um, but they've they've found the den sites, and and they're they're usually very close to the den. And they'll be in a, in an area where there's like scrub oak, and it's pretty thick, so predators can't get in there um, to bother the babies and bother the snake when she's when she's uh, when she's giving birth. Do you think rattlesnakes are probably your favorite animal to look for? You'd say. Yeah, like out of out of all the animals that I have here, um, I really don't have a fa- I mean, my crocodile is cool, but I don't really have that much of a favorite. But my favorite animal out of all the wild animals are the rattlesnakes, for sure. Awesome. And that's what I was hoping to transition to, actually, was the animals you have. So okay. how big is your collection exactly, numerically, you'd say? <sighs> oh, it fluctuates. I don't know. Um, we have animals that are definitely educational animals for the business. And then we have animals here for like our homesteading because I'm, I'm a survivalist and into preparedness too. So we have, you know, we have chickens. I raise quails for meat and eggs. We have meat rabbits. So, I mean, if you count all of them, it's well over a hundred wow. uh, for the, for the business itself, probably somewhere around 60, 70. Oh, so definitely the majority. 
Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, do you have mostly herps, reptiles, and amphibians for your shows usually? Or is it more mammals? What do you? Um, the majority are probably reptiles. When I do a show, though, if it's like a one-hour show, I, I like to bring seven animals. And from doing thousands of shows over years and years, I've noticed that like for a one-hour show, seven animals is the perfect amount of animals for how long I talk and, and show them and that kind of thing. And I'll bring like a lizard or, or a crocodile and then a snake, a turtle or tortoise. I'll bring a frog or a toad, some type of invertebrate, and then two furry animals. And that's usually my, my breakdown, unless people have specific requests, which people do quite commonly have requests. That's good to get some range, kind of. Yeah. What kind of, when you say crocodile, is it a caiman or an American crocodile? What exactly yeah, I, is it? I have uh, Cuvier's dwarf caimans, which are, which are they, it's funny because caimans, they're in the alligator family. Mm -hmm. but they look like a crocodile and i like to say they have the crocodile attitude <laughs> like they're they're feisty man I and mean, that's that's why i named mine cr cranky cuz cranky <laughs> yeah cuz he, he's 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 a he's a biter <laughs> cranky the caiman yeah perfect yeah so you say i usually have about 7 animals per show what do you think is as far as the behavior what do you think what animals are usually more manageable to bring um, to travel it depends. I mean, it really depends on the individual animal. I mean, in general, certain types are easier than others, but they're just like us. They all have personalities. It also depends on how I got the animal, if they've been abused and what they've been, been through, if they were handled before I got them. Sometimes when I get an, a new animal, um, they're ready to, to, you know, I'd be comfortable presenting them right off the bat. I don't. I let them get used to me and my house, their new environment for a while first, usually a month or two. But other ones, I can tell when I get there, I'm like, this animal is going to need a lot of work. Yeah. You know, I, I have a snake right now that I've had her for a year. I'm still not comfortable taking her out to a show. She's never been to a show mm -hmm. uh, because she's, she's feisty and I don't trust her yet. What kind of snake? Uh, Retic. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Beautiful snake. Yeah, I, I, I got a permit. You, you, they're illegal in mass, so I had to get a mass wildlife permit for her. Mm -hmm. So you'd say the probably the vast majority of your animals are some form of a rescue? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in the beginning, they were all rescues. Um, I mean, I started out, when I opened the business, I had a few animals that I had had from when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and I still have them. I have a, um, uh, a ball python uh, that I got when I was 17. And I have a common snapper that I got when I was 17 and two alligator snappers that I got when I was 17. Really? I still have them. So I started out with them and then a bunch of adoptions. And then over the years, just to try to stay competitive and stay in business, um, I've had to, you know, buy some at like expos and that kind of thing just to have more of a variety. Yeah. I don't like it, but I mean, it's the point where all of my competition, they buy from breeders and, and all kinds of things. And, and I, you know, I'm, I don't like it. I was against it at all for the longest time, but I was losing business because I just didn't have the variety of customers would request these animals. And I'm like, I don't have that. I'm not going to get that. And they go somewhere else. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a, kind of a survival thing at some point. At least in Massachusetts, how competitive would you say the business is? Like how many other vendors are showing? Would you say there are? There's a lot. It's crazy in Massachusetts and people don't realize that there's probably a handful of what I would call, the main ones, the, the large, larger companies that get most of the business, um, probably five of us. And I consider myself one of them, or at least I did before COVID. Yeah, we'll get to <laughs> but, that. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. But um, yeah, there's probably like five of the biggest companies that do the most business and are on the social media the most and get the most work um, and have the largest variety. And, and, you know, we, of course, all have liability insurance with like animal bite coverage and USD licenses and I have mass wildlife permits and we have all that stuff. But then there's a whole bunch of other smaller companies that seem to spring up and go away all the time. And, you know, these guys like don't have insurance, don't have the licenses and they kind of just do it. I don't know if it's part time or whatever, but um, when people shop around, I'm like, even if you don't pick me, just make sure they have insurance to protect yourself. Yeah. And make sure they're licensed. Uh, it's it's an important thing, and a lot of the companies don't do that because it's expensive and it's a pain in the neck. You know, I, I they come in and they, they do unannounced inspections of my animal rooms whenever they want, and I have paperwork I have to do. And part of my um, part of my USDA permit is a, a veterinarian has to come to my house and and check on all the animals here. Um, you know, when like you annually. Can, yeah, it's annually. At least at least annually. Hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot that that goes into it. 
if you're doing it the right way. Do you think that a lot, or maybe not a lot, but at least some of your animals have come from maybe these kind of sketchy, not approved shows where people buy some animals somehow and then try to make some money off them and then they say, I can't do this. And I don't know if, I don't know if any of that have come from, uh, from situations like that, but I've definitely, um, you know, I found animals on Craigslist for free adoption and, and I'll drive to pick them up. And I remember one time I went somewhere in Providence to get a hedgehog and it was like this really broken down neighborhood and it was at night and they were on the third floor of an apartment complex and there's a bunch of like teenagers hanging out smoking pot downstairs Jeez. and I have to like walk through them yeah. and then I have to go up the, the stairs to the third floor and the stairs are covered in trash you can't even see where the steps are damn and I get up to the apartment and I'm like oh my goodness this is like real hairy but I got the hedgehog and nothing happened but like that's what it's like sometimes <laughs> you just never know yeah I'd say it probably definitely feels good to take an animal out of a, a situation like that like that right yeah, I mean, they, they actually, came, the, the actual, when I got to the apartment, it was okay. It was just the neighborhood and the apartments below them that, that were sketchy. But mm. I've, I've gone some places too, or, you know, like the first ferret I got, I went to this, this girl's house in Worcester to adopt the ferret, and the ferret um, had, had, had a, a problem where it couldn't keep its weight on, and it turns out it, was, it, was, it had cancer already when I got it, so I only had that oh, ferret wow. for about a year. But she didn't. She couldn't afford to take it to the veterinarian, so she had no idea what was wrong with it. So yeah. She was giving it to me to like care for it better. But I mean, she also had like a five foot iguana that would run around her house, which is not good. And then she had like a eight foot boa constrictor in a fifty five gallon aquarium with a screen oh, wow. top with just like a brick, just like one little brick on top. The one and I was like, brick or something. Yeah, and like, and I was like, <laughs> I, I said to her, I'm like, do you you don't have locks on that? And she's like, oh no, he can't get out. And I was like, oh god. <laughs> like this is the kind of this is the kind of situation that's going to end up on the news or something, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, I don't know. Absolutely. Oh, uh, did you happen to watch? I know it's kind of past its prime, but did you happen to watch Tiger King way back in the day, back in March? Never. April? Nope. Nope. I that don't watch. A, I don't watch a lot of TV yet, but I don't. I don't watch that type of thing anyway. Yeah, I actually that was what my first podcast was on, and we talked about how that was really one of the central issues was people not really like, appreciating animals and not filling their real needs that was definitely a problem in the show and there was one scene where there was a news report of someone just letting out like tigers and bears out into a neighborhood oh my goodness so that's the type exact type of situation you're talking about people just yeah aren't educated and send out these animals funny thing uh when i got my usda license for the first time when the inspector came out to my house she's like do you know that in like the seventies, one of your neighbors, like five houses down used to have tigers in the backyard. And I'm like, get out of here. She's like, in Massachusetts. No, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And they got, they got them, they got them confiscated. Cause I definitely in mass in a lot of Northern States, I'd say it's not an issue, but I know in Texas, it's like every other backyard has got one practically in some areas. Yeah. Some States are like that, like Florida, Texas, there's a few other States too. It's a lot easier to have exotics. Um, and it's probably not a good idea for most people definitely yeah i i mean i don't agree with a lot of the different laws we have in mass it seems like every everything is strict here yeah um and there's and there's good and there's bad about it a lot of it is a pain in the neck for someone trying to do things the right way um i understand why the laws and the regs are there but um but this state is compared to other states it's it's a lot more there's a lot more rules you have to go by do you have an example of a law or regulation that's particularly difficult to deal with um just i mean just the fact that i run my business out of my home um a lot of the people in my state that do my job run out of our home because it's cheaper and it's easier to take care of the animals but the downside to that is dealing with the state coming in here and the usda coming in here and veterinarians coming in here and then i have a whole bunch of other permits for different things too and i've got people coming in and out of here all the time and it's it's like nerve-wracking you never know when they're going to show up um and i've never had an infraction but it's still kind of stressful ha ha yeah. having them having them come into your to your house you know so is the expectation to have some type of a facility separate just for your animals or uh their expectation well you said like it's more difficult because you keep them at home is would you say there'd be less checking up on you so to speak if you had a separate building no it would be the same it would just be less stressful for me because it wouldn't be my house. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, 
you know, like I, I have kids here and, and that kind of thing. And it's, just, it's different having strangers come into your house, you know, judging you to make yeah. sure you're doing things that, 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 that they should and... be doing. And, <laughs> and some of it's like a lot of it's by the book, but some of it's just their opinion. Also, there's always that there's always, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's some like leeway. this, this one individual inspector has a problem with this, even though on paper, it's not, not an infraction. Um, so what would you say kind of back to your shows themselves yeah i know you said you will present a lot to either children or the elderly and then sometimes some disabled groups Mm -hmm. um what would you say that's kind of a two-part question but first of all which would you say you present more to um nursing homes and assisted livings were kind of like my bread and butter They're, they're a staple because a lot of them would have me either monthly or quarterly Oh, wow. or you know or twice a year um and before covid i was trying to push the uh, the quarterly thing try to have have me come once a season and that Makes way that the shows are spread out and i'll bring different animals do a different theme each time for them so it's something different that's what i was gonna say if, if you're only bringing usually about seven as you said a show but then you have about 70 animals you can definitely bring variety to the same facility oh yeah oh yeah and then even if some of the animals do overlap i, I can make the content totally different you know, I have probably about 30 different themes that I can do and, and I don't have anything memorized. I just kind of just, if, if I show up and they're like, Oh, you did this last time. I'll be like, okay, let's talk about this today. And I just do it. Yeah. You know, the and, animals, and well it's, not a, that you can kind of, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, what would you say? Obviously children and the elderly are two very different demographics. What do you, how do you kind of cater to each group? What do you try to teach or entertain? differently between them the the making it fun and the entertainment is is pretty much the same um with kids versus the elderly um i also try to make it as hands-on as i possibly can um so touching is a big part of it um and with the elderly it's different because i do two different types of programs depending on if they're high functioning or if they have dementia for example if they have dementia it's less talking although i do talk the whole time but there's less there's less uh there's less content there and uh, it's more of the hands-on and me talking to them you know how are you you know what's what's your favorite animal have you ever had any pets like like that that type of stuff it's a lot more personal versus if it's a large group some of these nursing homes I go to there's 100 people in the room wow and it's more of a like almost like a stage presentation where I I make it hands-on but as I bring the animals around they pet them while I talk Um, Mm -hmm. but with kids um, first of all I try to get that on, on their level. So like if it's a library, for example, and there's going to be a bunch of kids showing up, like I'll sit on the floor with the kids before the show starts and I'll, I'll talk to them about what pets they have, what animals they think are going to be in the show and, and that kind of thing. And small talk with them and get them comfortable with me because I'm a stranger, you know, mm-hmm. and it's to kind of get them comfortable with me. That way they can be more open to the experience and, and have more fun. Um, and then I'm a lot more goofy with the kids and, and that <laughs> kind of thing. So um so I make it educational, but the educational part of it is a lot more subtle with, with the kids and not hitting them over the head with anything. Yeah, that makes sense. And I focus on the fun. And then at a birthday party, it's just, it's, it's mostly about the, fu- the fun. It's, you know, it's, it's um, safe, but it's fun. It's also educational, but the birthday is a lot more fun and a lot more about the birthday child. Like I'll make sure they get to have special experiences and they get to hold them or get to feed one a treat and make sure the parents get good photos and, and that kind of thing. So it's a little different. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Outside of your issues with keeping regulation and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. how would you say caring for your animals, both at home and on the road, what are the difficulties of that as far as feeding them, keeping their uh, containers clean, all stuff like that? Um, I have been struggling to try to get on a routine forever, and I'm really bad about it. So my, my way, which works for the most part is me just having in the back of my mind what they all need. It's almost mm-hmm. like, you know, if for an adult that has kids, you kind of always know in the back of your head, like where your kids are, what they're doing. You're listening. If it's too quiet for too long, you know, something's up. They're doing something they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> you know, with the animals, it's like, I know the snakes need, need to eat every so often for each snake. I know the lizards need, need this every so often. Um, but the furry animals need a lot more ongoing care. The reptile cages, I have a lot of that automated for me, which I've been working on over the years, you know, like I have um, under each cage is a heat mat 
um, the floor, I build the floors, I build plexiglass panels into the floor of each reptile cage. And I attach one of those zoom med heating pads underneath it. Mm -hmm. And I have that on a, on a lamp dimmer so I can adjust the temperature for each oh, wow. cage. And those are on 24 hours a day, but then there's the lighting, which is on a timer for each cage. Each cage also has an automatic misting system. And I have two different misting systems. One is for desert rep animals and one is for more of like tropical animals. So depending on what type of cage it is, I can adjust how much and how often they get misted. And then I have a, a dehumidifier, which takes the humidity out of the room. And then it goes through a hose down into the next room into a sink to drain it. And it's, it's automatic. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what misting had me thinking about is, do you have any amphibians or is it all reptiles within? Yeah, I have, I have several different types of frogs. I have, I have white tree frogs. I have um, African clawed frogs. I have pixie frogs. I have cane toads, which are really cool. Um, and then I have, um, several different types of tarantulas and I have, uh, two different types of cockroaches and I have, uh, three different types of scorpions. So for animals like that, the more I'd say moisture is definitely, um, very important compared to reptiles, right? For the frogs. Yeah. The, the invertebrates, it varies on the one, depending on if they are a desert species or, or rainforest species. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, so what I'd like to get to now is the big lurking topic that we've kind of referenced a couple of times, which is COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, the corona apocalypse. <laughs> yeah. So this is, oh, my, this is my fifth podcast, but it's my second in a series that I'm doing for a summer program at Clemson. And the whole idea of the program is to kind of document different industries within the biological and the animal field and how they're being affected by COVID. Okay. So I know you said you haven't been able to do shows since March. So if you'd like to talk about that, I'd love to hear. Yeah, sure. Um, I believe it was, well, let me back up. So in late February and the first week or so of March, I began getting emails and phone calls from customers. Um, some of them were canceling. Other ones were, let's postpone the show to a month out. Other ones were just calling me because like a lot of these customers I've been working with for 10 years, you know, every, every month or every two months. And like, we're kind of like friends and mm -hmm. we talk on the phone and stuff. So like they text me or call me and be like, I want to chat with you about, well, what are we going to do? And we brainstorm. I'm like, I don't know. We're going to have to see how bad it gets. At some point I may have to say, I'll still come, but I'll wear a mask and I won't allow touching and things like that. So we talked about that. But then um, about by the second week of March, everybody was canceling. Yeah. And I was like, you know, what? and I was watching the, the cases rise and everything in, in the state and in neighboring states. And, and I was like, I'm at the point where, you know, I don't feel comfortable me going out anymore. Mm -hmm. So I believe it was like the day before they closed everything down in mass. The day before that, I announced on Instagram that I was closing my business down temporarily until further notice. So I totally shut down. I think it was like March 14th. I shut down and I haven't done a single show since then um, a lot of libraries and such have been asking me to do uh, virtual shows like on zoom and stuff. And mm -hmm. I've declined, I've declined to, um, and a lot of like, I'm friends with several other owners of animal companies doing the same thing that I do. And I've talked to them about what they're doing. And most of them are doing the shows virtually. Um, and I'm sure by now a few of them are probably starting to go back to doing live shows, but, but I'm mm -hmm. not, I mean, I, what I think is I'm going to probably stay shut for the whole rest of the year. The whole calendar um, year. Yeah. Yeah. But just, just to, to, to make sure that I'm safe because you know, I'm immunocompromised. I've, I have asthma and I've had Lyme disease three separate times. Oh wow. Um, you know, three separate bites and three separate rounds of antibiotics in the whole nine yards. And mm -hmm. um, my muscles and joints hurt all the time. I feel breathing all the time. I get headaches, my eyes hurt. Um, and I think if I got it, there's a strong possibility that it would make me very sick or I could even die. Mm -hmm. And I'm the sole provider for my whole family. Yeah. So it could be a big impact on us if, if I brought that home. So, you know, uh, I'm really, really nervous about it. And customers are asking me to come do shows and I'm saying no. And we talk and, about and it stinks because that's, that's my income. You know, I, yeah. I make, you know, I do, I do get some money from, um, um, Patreon and YouTube and my book sales and um, 
Amazon links and stuff like that, but it's very, very minimal compared to what I would, what I would make if I was yeah, the doing bulkier work. shows, you know. And we talked about pre-show how even though it may sound on the surface crazy to be worried about, say, November, December, we talked about how, you know, this is maybe a cold weather virus. And uh, whereas the flu becomes an issue in November, COVID could come back even stronger. So would you definitely say that's kind of been on your mind? Yeah, I don't know if it's that much that it's a cold weather virus, but I, I think if you look back in history at other viruses and, and their trends, there, there tends to not be just one wave. There tends to be two or three. And also the second one usually tends to be worse. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if, if you look at all the craziness that happened because of the first wave, and arguably like what's happening down in Florida now and other states where it's spiking there, like people think it's a second wave there. I think it's just a continuation of the first wave. It's just hitting there for the first time. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to circle back around and when it kind of peters out there, it's going to travel to other states again. And I think by the fall, somewhere around the fall, it's going to come back here. And I think it's going to be worse than before. And I don't know if they're going to lock us down or not. And if things, you know, if school is going to be in session or not. Um, but I think you need to think about that and prepare, you know, stock up things on things now and prepare in case things get even crazier, you know, have food, have a way to, you know, keep your, your things charged, some, you know, some things for security for good, for God's sakes, have toilet paper. Yeah. No kidding. <laughs> I actually, I stopped using TP to make sure my family could use it. I began taking animal blankets that I'd use to cover the animal carriers at shows and mm-hmm. I cut them up into like four by six pieces. And I began using those to wipe my bum and then I'd wash them. <laughs> and it's been, and I've been doing that for like three months and, and I don't think I'm going to go back to TP now. I, I think it's great. I think it's better. Wow. So, I mean, there's an option for you. If so, but, yeah. um, if something for people, good is going to come out of it. Yeah. So, I mean, like for people that have animals too, and, and, and I've been saying this to people also, like think about how you would care for your pet. Make sure you have extra animal food stored up. Make sure you have extra cat litter, um, you know, extra aquarium filters, extra heating bulbs for your reptiles, all that stuff. And, and additional way in, ca- in case you lose power to keep your animals warm. You know, I have two different generators. I have an emergency battery bank system that I, that I built myself. Um, that I can keep the animal animals warm with and keep on recharging it. Um, things like that. You should think about how to care for your animals in case this gets bad too. Yeah, I definitely think that's something that you could easily overlook while you're worrying about caring about yourself and the other people in your life is your pets. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I, you know, I believe people come first, but your pets are an important part of your family, especially the children, you know, and yeah. they're, they're an important part of the family. And if you're stuck home, because you're socially distancing, it's almost like your pets are now your personal pet therapy (laughs) and your entertainment. It's like, yeah, they're your entertainment. They keep you calm. You can snuggle with them depending on what the animal is and just take care of them. And and it kind of helps, keeps you calm and helps, helps to keep everyone in your house from wanting to break each other's necks for being stuck in the house so long. Mm -hmm. Would you say your animals have been able to do that for you and your family the past couple months? Um, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, we have we have a house cat um, named Ollie, and and he'll snuggle with you and stuff. But a lot of the animals for work, you know, we we I don't bring them up here very often. I mean, when my eleven year old is here, um, he'll he'll build Legos with my python wrapped around his neck, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and he'll build forts for for my my sugar glider and stuff, and and that kind of thing. And and my fiance Shannon will go outside, and so she, she'll she'll um sit with the chickens and. She'll sit in a chair and like all 10 chickens will end up on her in a pile. <laughs> Wherever they can fit. Uh, she'll have a chicken snuggle. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I love interacting with chickens, actually. I have a friend who has a coop and they're just so fun. The chickens are really, they're like little velociraptors. They're so cool. <laughs> and Definitely. they're about to start laying eggs like any day now. We're going to start getting the first, the, first, the first eggs. So we're looking forward to that. That's awesome. Yeah. You say in regards to food, you're pretty self-sustaining to a degree. Our food or animal food? Uh, your own food. Our own food. Um, we still have quite a food bill, but um, we have um, extensive gardens. I mean, before this year, we had a 30-foot diameter circle lasagna garden, which is like a layering method of gardening. Mm-hmm. And it's automatically irrigated. And the circle is like broken up like a pizza. It's like eight slices, like eight, okay. eight beds with a, with, a, with a footpath in the middle of each one. Um, and we, we grow tons of food there. And then when COVID hit, I began 
creating more gardens all around here. We have right outside the window here, we have a new 12 by 16 garden, which is mostly greens to feed the animals and um, some, um, some squash and herbs and things like that. And then in the front of the house, we have two other garden beds for various things. We're growing pumpkins up there and watermelon and we have all kinds of stuff. And then I have a whole fruit forest. I grow um, five different types of grapes. We have apple trees, pear trees, peach trees, plum trees, apricots, um, all different, all kinds of stuff out there. Awesome. We, have, we just got blueberries. We have six blueberry bushes now. Um, so we've been really working on, working on a lot of that to make us as self-sufficient as possible. And then we've got the rabbits, the meat rabbits, and we've got the quail eggs. You know, we get 20 quail eggs every day. Dang. Um, and then the chickens are going to start laying. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I fish and, and I have, a, I have a hunting license on top of that. And I know a lot of people that are into animals may or may not disagree with hunting, but I think it's an important thing. Yeah, so, that's something so I've discussed that. on past episodes a lot is even though on the surface it's killing an animal, which when you don't lead into it sounds like a bad thing. Right. Um, we have talked about how hunting, obviously sustainable hunting, regulated, can be a very good tool for conservation. Yeah, and it's, it's very, for me my two businesses are, are very, very different as far as that. And it's easy to kind of think, well, this guy's a hypocrite. You know, he loves animals and educates about them and he rescues them, but then he kills them too. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what's the alternative? The alternative is, I mean, I like eating meat. I'm not going to become a vegetarian or a vegan. Um, and for someone that likes meat, the alternative is getting meat from a supermarket where you don't know if the animal had a good life or not. And the meat's not that fresh by the time you get it. Right. But if you hunt or if you grow your own, you know, wild animals have a good life. They're healthy. They were free. Um, and then if you grow your own meat, you're in direct control of the quality of that animal's life and the quality of your food. Yeah. So, you know, which is better? I, I believe growing your own food and or harvesting your own wild game is better. Yeah, that def I definitely, think it keeps you, definitely think it keeps you in touch too, like you said. Whereas you, if you just buy a package of, red, of hamburgers, it doesn't look like it came from an animal and you can go and be anti-hunting, but an animal did die in that process too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of children nowadays too, they, they think food comes from the supermarket. They don't get it. They don't get that. They don't, they don't make the connection and adults too, you know, mm -hmm. like I had a conversation with, with adults where, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to butcher an animal or something and we're going to have it for dinner, they're like, Oh no, I, I won't eat that. I can't eat it. But it's because they're used to seeing meat. That's, that's all pretty and packaged in the store. It doesn't look like an animal anymore. Yeah. You know, Definitely. And so you kind of mentioned your two businesses. So your first is obviously animal world experience. Uh, you want to tell us about your second? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been into survival skills since I was a kid. So um, when I was probably 12, I mean, I was in Cub Scouts and that kind of thing when I was a kid and always into hiking and camping. And uh, um, when I got, went into college, I got into backpacking and stuff, but, um, and I've always been into fishing. But when I was 12, my dad bought me this book called uh, Tom Brown's Guide to Wilderness Survival. And it's still, I've read dozens of survival books to this day. This is by far the best book I've ever read. And um, right before my first son was born, I went to Tom Brown's survival school, which is in New Jersey. It's called Tracker School. It's in the Pine Barrens. And I went there and I took a week-long survival course where you live in the woods with like 100 people. And you're in class like 12, 14, 15 hours a day with no breaks. It's intense. Basically you live it, right? Yeah. And you, you live in there. I mean, you live in a tent in the, f the first course we lived in, in our tents and, you know, they cook for you and stuff, but you're just there to learn and you're, you know, they, they hit you hard with it. And then I went back three years later for a week long advanced course. And in that course, that was crazy because that one teaches you to survive anywhere in North America with nothing long term. So what they did to help transition us and give you an experience was they're like, we're going to teach you on the first day how to build a debris hut shelter. And you're going to start building, each of you is going to build your own shelter. And by the third day, your shelter needs to be done. And everyone's like, what if our shelter, what if my shelter's not done? They're like, on the third day, we're going to, we're going to come around and we're going to take your tents and your sleeping bags and we're going to lock them up in our wow. truck. And you'd better have your shelter done because it gets in the thirties at night in May in the Pine Barrens. So everyone's like, oh crap. And the same thing, like you need to make your own wooden bowl and spoon by the third day because we're going to take your mess kits away. And if you don't have your bone spoon done, we're not going to let you eat. Wow. So like come the third day, everyone's around the fire, putting coals in their bowl, blowing on them, trying to like burn, burn the bowl in like in a panic, 
Yeah. Them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so that formed a lot of like the, my core of information. And then from there, I went home and, and just all the time practicing skills. You know, I have two different survival camps that I've built um, in the woods surrounding my house. You know, one's that way and one's that way. And I have a wigwam built on one of them. And the other one, I just began building um, a much larger shelter. And that's where I go to, you know, have quiet time and reflect. And, and uh, that's where I go to practice my skills and stuff too. So, um, so that helps me learn a lot by practicing. And so I opened up, um, I didn't open up. I began under the umbrella of animal world experience. I began offering certain survival courses, I think probably in 2012, somewhere around there. Um, but then last year I separated the two businesses um, and my YouTube channel, I call animal man survivor. Cause everyone knows me from doing animal shows. I'm the animal man, you know? Mm -hmm. So to make it easy, I'm like, okay, animal man survivor. So that's what I call that business now. Awesome. And you have a YouTube channel for that, correct? I have a YouTube and Instagram and Facebook for that and Patreon for that. And um, I'm in the, excuse me, I'm in the process of writing several books about, um, you know, different survival, survival things. Um, that'll be published, uh, self-published and available on Amazon and also, um, you know, hard copy and then the Kindle version I'm going to do too. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so that's the deal with that. And I'm really, really into that because that envelopes the survival, bushcraft, anything outdoors, preparedness, you know, being a prepper, although I hate that word, um, <laughs> all that, all that stuff. And I, th I, I think now, now that, that we're in this pandemic, a lot of people are kind of, kind of opening their eyes to being more prepared, but the level that I'm at is different. Most people look at being prepared as stocking more TP and keeping the freezer full and stocking pasta and, you know, hoarding stuff, right. Rice and beans and stuff like that. Yeah. But there's, there's a different level to that where if you really get into it and really want to learn and, and get this skill set, um, you, you skip to the next level, which is, learning how to um be more more self-sustaining how to how to how to grow your own food and how to forage your own food wild edible plants um you know hunting trapping fishing all that stuff and that that's the level that most people aren't interested in or will, will never get to they, they don't look past the the hoarding as you yeah. said <laughs> um, but that's an important thing to think about but it takes a lot of a lot of time developing the skills to be able to be um, effective at being able to do that, especially if it's, if it's you as the head of your household thinking about being able to do enough to support your whole family that way. It's a lot, you know, so it's, it's a lot, it takes a lot. Absolutely. Um, and so I think it's a good kind of way to segue into wrapping up. I'd like to give you the chance to kind of advertise yourself as far as obviously your <laughs> business, um, your YouTube channels, your Patreon, all stuff. I could put some links as well. So, okay. Yeah. Just give yourself a pitch. Yeah, so um, the first animal business is Animal World Experience, and that's the same on all the platforms. The YouTube is Animal World Experience, the same on Facebook, Instagram, um, and uh, there's a Patreon for that. And then um, same thing with the survival business. It's Animal Man Survivor. That's the YouTube. Uh, that's the website, the Patreon. I'm trying to push the Patreon a lot now. And, um, and yeah, so, so those are the two businesses, and that, that's how to find me. Awesome. Like I said, I'll throw some links once I publish this on YouTube. I'll put some links in the description so everyone can see all that stuff. Um, maybe even get ready to book shows once all this blows over. <laughs> yeah, we'll see Whatever. when that happens. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for being on. I thought it was a really great conversation. Thanks. Thanks for having me, man.